You have heard about local storage. You might have also heard about IndexedDB as a storage thing in browsers. But have you heard about something known as origin private file system? This is one of the things which I have very recently discovered. I'm very surprised that I did not know it after working years with local storage and a lot of time with IndexedDB also. But apparently this is something which Notion also uses. So what Notion has done is that they compile SQLite with Wasm and ship it to the browsers and under the hood, in order to store the data of the SQLite, where the SQLite file is stored, they use something known as origin private file system. Now in this video, I want to get into depths of this blog post and this API also cover a little bit about it. Why do Notion not use local storage or index DB at all, which we, by the way, like, you know, we as developers consider as a very stable option for storing data. And what does it mean for you as an end developer? All right, so three years ago, we successfully sped up Notion app for Mac and Windows by using a SQLite database to cache data on the client. We also use the SQLite caching in our native mobile application. This year, we have been able to deliver the same improvement to the users who access Notion through their web browsers. This article is deep dive into how we used WebAssembly implementation of SQLite to improve Notion's performance in the browser. Right, so they're coming up with a few performance numbers and in general, like what improvements happened after SQLite. But I think the more interesting question here is that, you know, that they are using something like SQLite in browsers, right? So the core technologies over here is OPFS and web workers. So in order to persist data across session, the Wasm SQLite library uses origin private file system or also known as OPFS, a modern browser API that lets a site read from and write to files on user's device. Now let me tell you why this is necessary. So if you look at a website in general, what you would see is that this is a website and if let's say if this website needs to process some data, there are very limited options for this website, right? You can't do, you know, you can't just open a file system directly, even though like OPFS is exactly what it is. But it, let, imagine you don't have OPFS, right? So what do you have as an option? Let's discuss all the exhaustive options. So the first option you have over here is something known as local storage, right? Which we all know and love and it has been like for years, maybe like more than a decade now in browsers, which allow you to just set and get key value pairs, right? Local storage dot set something, local storage dot get that thing. The next thing you have is so known as session storage, right? So session storage also sort of works similar to how local storage would work, but it's only persisted for a session. So if you close your browser and open it again, you will just lose the data. The third thing, which is also there, it's not exactly for storing data, but can be used. That is for cookies, right? So you can store some sort of data in cookies also, which I mean, the drawback here is that if it becomes an HTTP only cookie or JavaScript can't access it. And plus cookies are like sort of expensive also because you are sending them in every round trip to every HTTP request, right? The fourth API, which relatively is like, we consider it as a low level API is the index DB, right? So index DB API is an API, which allows you to communicate and store massive amounts of data, right? So unlike local storage and session storage, which carry like a five, 10 MB limit per website, this storage does not have any limits as such. I mean, of course it would have limits enforced by a browser and operating system, but not so low, like you can't store anything. So you can download like, you know, a few megabytes or a few gigabytes of data also in index DB, keep them there, all of that stuff you can do. However, there is a new player in town, according to me. Now this technology might be old, but to be very honest, I was not aware about it myself, which is this OPFS, right? OPFS. O origin private file system. Very cool name, 10 on 10 for the name, because the name denotes like what it's gonna be. It's a file system, which is private to the origin, right? So it'll operate like a file system, but origin private. So you already have like, you know, the course feeling a little bit over here inbuilt in the name itself. So the OPFS offers low level byte by byte file access, which is private to the origin of the page and it's not visible to the user. As a result, it doesn't require the same series of security checks and permission grants and it's therefore faster than file system access API calls. So you can see OPFS is also subject to browser storage quota restrictions, just like any other origin partition storage mechanism, for example, index DB, right? And what these quota restrictions are. So you can see that the data stored by other web technologies like index DB, cache API or file system API which is like OPFS, is managed by a storage management system that's specific to each browser, right? So on Firefox, it's 10% of the total disk size or 10 GB. For Chrome, 
origin can store up to 60% of total disk size. For example, if you have a one terabyte hard disk, you can store up to 600 GB. I mean, which is crazy amount of data, right? So you would not ever run out of it. Hopefully, unless you are doing something weird in your web application. But anyway, coming back to the blog post, what these guys are doing now is that they are storing a SQLite database because SQLite is a single file, right? Into the OPFS and then they are using, literally they are writing SQL in browser to communicate with that and store that. The Vasm SQLite library can only use OPFS for its persistence layer in web workers. A web worker can be thought of as a code. That is fine. So web workers also has access to OPFS, right? Which is great. So our shared worker powered approach, our final architecture was based on a novel solution that Roy laid out in GitHub discussion. He described an approach where only one tab can access SQLite at a time while still permitting other tabs to execute SQLite queries. So they have a shared worker powered approach. Okay, so in a nutshell, each tab has its own dedicated web worker that can write to SQLite. However, only one tab is permitted to use its actual web worker. A shared worker is responsible for managing which is the active tab. And when the active tab closes, the shared worker knows to select the new active tab. To detect closed tabs, we must open, we open an infinitely open web block on each tab. And if that web block closes, the tab must have closed. I mean, obviously I don't understand the nuances and the architecture of Notion, but this looks a lot like service worker, right? So you have a web worker, sure, but if this is a service worker, then you just have one worker at a given path, right? And then you could potentially solve this problem. Of course, in service worker, you would get a problem when a new worker is coming up, so you'll have to solve that. But this shared architecture thing solves when you are using a service worker. So prior to build an architecture described above, we tried to get Vasm SQLite running in a more straightforward way, one dedicated web worker per tab, within each web worker writing to the SQLite. So they were not able to do this architecture where every web worker is able to write to every SQL, you know, to the same SQLite file because it would have likely corrupted the database, which is, which I mentioned, right? So the corruption issues. When we turned on OPFS via SQLite 3 VFS to a small percentage of users, we started seeing a severe bug for some of them. The users will see wrong data on a page, a comment attributed to the wrong coworker, for example, or a link to a new page whose preview was completely different page, right? So the data corruption started happening in the local SQLite. We hypothesized that the problem was caused by concurrency issues. Multiple tabs might be open and in each tab had a dedicated web worker that had an active connection. I mean, not this would not be the real like reason of the corruption, but not to add on to this, but SQLite also does not have checksums, right? So if your data is like truly corrupted because of some sort of, you know, bit flipping or something like that, which happened by mistake, then SQLite also doesn't recover from it, but that's okay. I mean, that's like just an advanced thing. So we started looking, logging corruption errors and then tried a few banded approaches like adding web logs, only having the focus in focus tab right to the SQLite. These tweaks lowered the rate of corruption, but not enough that we were confident that we could turn on this feature on production traffic again. So after like a couple of more obstacles, they figured out the shared worker architecture and they figured out this is what works the best for us, which is basically this one where an active web worker is the only one that can query the database and rest of the workers have to talk to this worker in order to get some queries run, right? So your background tabs may be making some queries, but they are coming to the worker, which is running in the active tab and that's making the SQL queries. So once they did that, they figured out that their page load got slow. Why? Because users has to download and process the Vasm SQLite binary, which blocked the page load progress, preventing other page load operations from happening concurrently. Since this library is a few hundred kilobytes, the extra time was noticeable. So they made Vasm SQLite load asynchronously. And by the time it was loading, they did not fetch anything from SQLite. And slow devices didn't benefit from caching. I mean, because in slow devices, what they figured out is that the time they are using to read from SQLite Vasm to the OPFS to everything and the API call, it was sort of more or less the same, right? So what they did is that they just promise raised two asynchronous requests. So they'll call the SQLite API also and they'll call their REST API also or whatever they use against each other. We simply re-implemented this logic in the code path for navigation clicks and I mean, whatever returns you the response faster, just do that. Which is interesting, right? Because on some low power devices, your network is faster than going through this vast some abstraction layer to the disk, fetching it, running the query and getting the cache back. But yeah, this is an interesting blog post. And most importantly, this taught me about this new API, which I did not know before, which is the open 
OPFS, Origin Private File System. That's all for this video. I'll leave all the links in the description, all the links for blog posts and the APIs. Do check it out. Let me know what you think about this blog post. If you like this, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I will see you in the next video really soon.